salvation. It's a call to tell there is a God salvation. For the ways of life is that they need the gospel light. All around us we can see that men are dying. Day by day they pass away, there's no denying. For we need to rise and go to spread the gospel light. Tell about the love of God, how he gave his only son. Tell about his death at Calvary, to redeem the sons of men. them in every disease. In, in the name of Jesus Christ, pray the gospel pray the gospel At Calvary to redeem the sons of men. Preach to them in every every life in Jesus name and make you strong to do everything the Lord is revealing to us to do I'll be strong why don't you close your eyes as we pray together father we thank you for our Bible study thank you for this glorious day and glorious time thank you for this study we have tonight we're asking oh Lord you reach everyone with your word in Jesus name 
And we pray that this word will touch every life. Transform every life. And make us, Lord, to go in the direction of obedience to your word in Jesus' name. Be with your people, Lord. Keep us awake. Help us to understand. Help us to apply the word to our lives. We will not be forgetful hearers, we'll be doers of the word. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. In our study, we're coming to the gospel according to St. John. And you already know that we are in John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, from the beginning, we meet uh, this man. This man was born blind. And then the Lord saw him. The disciples asked a question. How was this man born blind? Is it because of his personal sin that he had sinned, obviously, before he was born, or because of the sins of the parents? And the Lord Jesus said, not at all. It's not because of his own sin, and it's not because of the sins of his own parents, but that the work of God will be done, and God will be glorified. Look at chapter 9, verses 1 to 3. It says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the work of God, the works of God, should be made manifest in him, telling us that whenever you see a challenge in your life, you see a problem in your life, a sickness or a kind of deformity or something you even brought to this world with you, and you're asking, what have I done? What have I done? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? Understand what Jesus said. God has permitted that sin, allowed that sin, that the work of God will be done in you. The miracle of God will be done in you. And the power of God will be manifested in your life in Jesus' name. And that situation you think is negative will bring glory to God in your life in Jesus' name. And they were to look at verse 6 and it says, And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And then it says in verse 7, and he sa and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is, by interpretation, said, He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came, seen. Like you are going to go from the Bible study tonight with your miracle. Yeah. For the power of the Lord upon your life in Jesus' name. Look at this miracle, the miracle of giving clear sight and perfect sight to this man that was born blind, was special and spectacular. And it says, if you look at it, verse, 30, verse 32, it says, since the world began. Now the man is talking about the miracle. He said, you Pharisees, you are interviewing me, interrogating me as to how did this happen and what happened here. He said, since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind. He said, what has happened to me is spectacular. What has happened to me is special. What has happened to me has never happened to any other person. See, I was born blind. And then he made clay. And he told me to go and wash in the post I love. And I went and came back seeing. It was uh, one of the proofs of the Lord Jesus Christ that this is the Christ. And this is the Son of God, the only Savior sent from uh, heaven. Actually, John tells us, that's why he wrote the gospel. If you look at John chapter 20, John chapter 20, reading from verse uh, 30 and verse 31, it says, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But look at verse 31, but these are written. All the miracles I've collected here, John is saying, uh, of turning water into wine, these are reaching. And in the man that was uh, 38 years in impotent, and the Lord healed him, he said, these are reaching. And this one we're looking at now, that uh, is recorded only in this uh, gospel, according to St. John, he said, these are reaching, that he might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have uh, life through his name. 
And so you will see that John recorded this miracle because it had a special a sign, a special proof that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and is the Savior and is the one to turn us away from our sin and from darkness to the light of the gospel and to get us to heaven. This miracle happened because of the obedience of the recipient. Understand that this miracle happened because the man obeyed the Lord. And let's come to chapter 9 again. I'm reading from chapter 9 of John. And I'm reading from verses uh, 6 and 7. It says, When he had thus spoken, he his part on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go. You see, he gave, he gave him a commandment, and the man was still blind, and the man could have been saying, how could I go? How could I go and wash? Because I, you have even put clay on my eyes. How will I do that? But this man obeyed the Lord, and it says, go, wash in the pool Siloam, which has been interpreted, saint, and it says, and he went his way. Therefore, I washed and came, tell me, tell me out aloud. You'll see in Jesus' name. And look at his testimony. His testimony emphasized that obedience to the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to have a miracle, like you're going to have a miracle tonight, you must be obedient to the word of the Lord. Obedience is very important. Look at verse 11. He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and uh, anointed mine eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam, and wash. Look at this. And I went, and I went, and I went, and washed, and I received sight. Look at verse 15 here. In verse 15 it says, Then again the Pharisees also asked him, How, had, how he had received his sight? And he said unto them, He put clay on mine eyes, and I washed, and I do see. And I washed, and I do see. You will see. Because you wait, because you obeyed, that's why the miracle happened unto him. If we are just in there, understand, God is all powerful. Understand, Jesus is mighty. Understand, all things are possible with God. Understand, Jesus Christ could open the eyes anytime, and he can open your eyes today. He can heal your sickness today. He can destroy the works of the devil today. But you know one thing, he gave the man a commandment. He said, yes, the way this miracle will come to you is that you will be obedient. And Jesus Christ is still the same. If you're going to get saved, it's going to give you a commandment to repent. If you're going to get sanctified, it's going to tell to lay everything on the altar and consecrate. If you're going to be baptized in Holy Ghost, it's going to give you commandment, don't leave Jerusalem, tarry ye there, until ye be and they power from on high. If you're going to have your prayers answered, you must check up your life. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Obedience was demanded by the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's still the same today. We're told in Hebrews chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. That means what he did then is still doing today. And what he said then is still going to say today. He demands obedience if we're going to have the blessing of the Lord. Actually, as we look at your Bible, you find that obedience is required as we relate with God. As God get, gets us uh, the answers to our prayers, and as God honors us with the fulfillment of his promises, we need obedience to the word of God. Genesis chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 18. Genesis chapter 22, and we're reading here from verse 18. It says, and in thy seed, that's talking to Abraham, almighty God, the Almighty God talking to Abraham, and he said, In the sea shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, look at this, because, 
because because thou hast obeyed my voice it says uh, the promise i give you i'm going to fulfill and then all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you because you have obeyed my voice we're looking at exodus chapter 23 Exodus chapter 23, and I'm reading from verse 22. Exodus chapter 23, reading from verse 22, it says, But if, if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, you see that, it's giving us the condition every time. And it's saying that you are going to be healed, you need to obey the Lord, you're going to have miracle, you need to obey the Lord, you're going to have your life turned around, you need to obey the Lord. It says, But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies. Somebody said amen. amen. And an adversary unto thine adversaries. And then look at verse 25. And ye shall serve the Lord your God. This is talking about me. I said it's talking about me. And ye shall serve the Lord your God. And ye shall bless thy bread and bless thy water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. And you know, he didn't say only when you are young, only when you are of middle age, or when you are getting old. He said, every time, if you just obey my voice, obey my word, he says, I'll take sickness from the midst of thee. He'll take sickness away from the midst of me. From my brain, from my blood, from my bones, from my body, every part of me, sickness is gone. How about you? I said, I about you. And he said, it's on the basis of the condition that we are obedient to the word of the Lord. In verse 26, it says, there shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. The number of your days he will fulfill. We're looking at Job, Job chapter 36, and I'm reading from verse 10. Obedience is very important. Obedience is very essential. Obedience is central. Obedience is the very foundation. If we're going to enjoy the fulfillment and the goodness of the promises of God. It tells us in Job chapter 36, and I'm reading from verse 10. Job chapter 36, and we're reading from verse 10. Here it tells us, he openeth also their ear to discipline, and commandeth that they return from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, you see that? If they obey and serve him, somebody cannot just say, I'm coming to the church, I'm listening to the Bible study, I've been taking part in all these things without an active obedience to the word of God. He commanded you to repent. Have you repented? He commanded you to lay everything on the altar, surrender everything to the Lord. Have you done that? He commanded you to pray. Have you done that? He commanded you to go and tell other people. Have you done that? You see, the blessings were received, and the miracles were received. They are based on obedience to the word of the Lord. It says in verse in verse eleven, if they obey and serve Him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. I thought somebody there would say, Amen. Amen. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1, and I'm reading here from verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, come now, come now, come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Do your sins be as scarlet? They shall be as white as snow. Do they be red like crimson? They shall be as well. Look at verse 19. If ye be willing and, what's the word there? Tell me out aloud. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. He bases everything on obedience to the word. That's why as we come to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Here reading from verse 5. John chapter 2. Reading from verse 5. His mother says unto them, said unto them, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. It might not be something you have heard before, but he's saying it to you, do it. It may not be scientifically proving to you, but whatever he says to you, do it. That might not look like a reasonable thing to do. We're looking for wine, and he tells us to go and fill the pores with water. Don't argue. Whatsoever he says unto you, do it, and the miracle will come your way. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men.
You understand that? Because you are a man, the commandment of man might look reasonable to you, might look accessible to you, might look acceptable to you because you are a man, because you are human. The commandment of another human being might, uh, you know, be all right with you. But God might command you something different from that what man, that woman, that human being is seeing. And then Peter said, this is what we are going to do. We ought to be God rather than men. What's the result of that? Look at verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. He doesn't give the evidence of the Holy Ghost to those who disobey. He doesn't give the power of the Holy Ghost to those who disobey. He doesn't give the revelation, the insight, the opening of their eyes, the understanding, the illumination of the Holy Ghost to those who disobey. But he says he has given the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. Hebrews chapter 5 we're looking at verse 9. Hebrews chapter 5, reading from verse 9. Obedience is very central, very essential, very important. And it tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all that obey him. He became the author of eternal salvation. Some people say we're saved eternally if we obey him. Unconditional salvation, there's nothing like that. Unconditional security, there's nothing like that. The condition is that we we'll obey Him, and because we we'll obey Him, He has provided eternal salvation for those who obey Him. It's like when God called Abraham. Look at chapter 11 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 8, when He called him. Look at this. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive an inheritance, he obeyed. What did he do? I t tell me out loud. What did he do? He obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. He obeyed. He obeyed. There's something about the obedience of Abraham. There's something about the response of Abraham that God wants to impress upon your heart. That if you will obey like he obeyed, God is going to bless you. And he's going to bless you beyond your expectation. He'll even start from tonight in Jesus' name. And let me just show you something, just one point about the obedience of Abraham in Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. I'm reading from verse 3. This is very important. You even need to underline this in your Bible. And you need to commit yourself to this, that this is the way Abraham obeyed the Lord. While the blessing came upon him, and this is the way he wants you to obey him. In Isaiah chapter 51, verse 2, look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah, that bear you, listen to this, for I called him, tell me the next word, I called him, tell me that word aloud. I, 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 I called him, how? Alone and blessed him and increased him. I called him alone. Have you noticed that the commandment that Jesus gave to this blind man, he gave it to him alone. Not him and Peter, not him and John. Not him and helper. And the man obeyed the Lord, number one, without complaint. He just went ahead. The Lord has commanded me. And he's not looking around who is doing this, who is doing that. He called me alone. He told me alone. He told him and he obeyed without companionship. There was nobody around him to say, okay, I'll encourage you. I'm going to go with you. The Lord is calling you. And when God calls you, he calls you alone. And he called you without any comparison. You know, this is how he did it before in Matthew. He did it like that in Mark. He did it like that in Luke. Why is my own different? He did not make any canal comparison. He said, he has told me, he called him alone. There's the word of God coming to you and coming to you alone. By the grace of God, you are going to obey and it is that obedience to the word of Christ that was so essential in receiving the miracle that he received. We're coming back to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Today we're looking at verses 13 all through to verse 29. Verses 13 to 29. Boldly confessing Christ 
before the blind, hostile world. Boldly confessing Christ before the, uh, before the blind, hostile world. Look at verse 13 here. It says in verse 13, And they brought him, that is, they brought, this, they brought the blind man who had been healed to the Pharisees. They brought him who was a time blind to the Pharisees. And now a lot of things are going to happen. Interrogation. That is, you are going to question him. Indignation. They were going to get angry. How could Jesus do that on the Sabbath day? And then you are going to find the man having kind of a insight into the word of God that even those Pharisees did not have. I said uh, what we are looking at today is boldly confessing Christ before the blind whose style world. There are three points we are going to look at. Number one, the false interpretation and indignation of the blind Pharisees, of the blind Pharisees, the false interpretation. Because you see, there's a way they looked at the Sabbath, and there were things they thought this could be done on the Sabbath day, and this could not be done on the Sabbath day because of their false interpretation. Number one, the false interpretation and indignation of the blind Pharisees. Let's come to chapter 9, John chapter 9. And I'm reading here from verse 13. It says, They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day. That's the point. It was the Sabbath day. That was the bone of contention. It was the Sabbath day. That was the, uh, the origin of the conflict. It was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and I do see. I like the testimony. It will be your testimony. Look at verse 16. Therefore, 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 said some of the Pharisees, This man, they were referring to Christ. This man, referring to Jesus. This man, referring to this miracle worker. This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath. The way they interpreted Sabbath law is that you will not do any good thing at all. You just stay somewhere, no cooking and nothing, nothing at all. And if you did anything, even if you are saving life, for them, that was wrong. They are wrong, they are false interpretation. So they said, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day, others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him? And he say that he opened thine eyes. And he said, What did he say? I said, What did he say? It's a prophet. He said, This one is not an ordinary man. This one is not a Pharisee. This one is not a religious fanatic. This one is not a religious personality. This is a prophet. It's somebody that came from God and has done this for me. But first of all, let us see their false interpretation. The false interpretation of the Sabbath. Their understanding was you shouldn't do anything at all. Anything at all. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. They had read the word, but they didn't understand. They also didn't understand the law of Moses or the word of Moses that said, a prophet shall God say it in my place, just like unto me. He will declare to you the word of the Lord. And whatsoever he says unto you, that you will do. Christ wants to come and give the proper interpretation to the word of God. They were reading, they didn't understand. And his actions were the proper interpretation. His uh, preaching was the proper interpretation. His doctrine, his teaching was the proper interpretation. Everything he did, they should have looked at that and said, okay, we didn't understand before. We thought that the Sabbath was to be like this, but his action has now given us the right interpretation of the Sabbath. I 
Isaiah chapter 58, and I'm reading from verse 10. In verse 10 it says, And thou draw out thy soul to the hungry. You see that? Draw your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. The blind man was afflicted, afflicted with blindness, and Jesus reached out to him. Then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness as the noonday, and the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden. And like the spring of water, whose waters fail not, and they that shall be of thee, your own children, your own offspring, and the people, your own converse, they shall be of the old world's places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the bridge, and the restorer of the past to dwell in. That's what Jesus was doing in restoring the health of the people. That's what Jesus was doing in turning the lives of the people around. That's what Jesus was doing, giving a sight to the blind. Look at this, verse 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy own pleasure on my holy day, Jesus was not doing his own pleasure. He was doing the pleasure of the Father and the pleasure of God and the will of God. And then he goes on to say and call the Sabbath, the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him at not doing thine own ways, nor finding thy own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. He came and he said, I will not speak my word, only what the Father gives me to say, that's what I say. What he does, that's what I do. My father walketh hitherto, and I walk. He was doing everything the father wanted him to do. Look at verse 14. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride on the high places of the earth. And feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father. For, my, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It will happen in our lives. You honor the Lord on the holy day, on the day of the Lord. You honor the Lord. You're not doing your own thing. You're not going to the bad beach. You're not taking you know, all these photographs. And you're not doing all these ceremonies. And you're not going to the picnic spot. Everything you want to do, just serve the Lord and minister to people and teach the word of God. And be a benefit to people around you. Blessings will come upon your life. And I will come to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 13. You'll see their misinterpretation of the Sabbath. What they thought you could do and what they thought you couldn't do. Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 13. And he laid his sense on her, on the woman that was bent down, could not lift up herself. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. The ruler of the synagogue answered with what? It was that bitterness, wrath, anger. How could you do that? That woman had been benched now all these many years. Leave her like that. On the Sabbath day, you shouldn't relieve that person. They misunderstood Sabbath completely. And then it says, the six days, there are six days in which men not to work. In them therefore come and be healed. And not on the Sabbath day. Look at verse 15 now. The Lord then answered him and said, tell me. Say it aloud. Amen. Thou hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath, lose his ox and his ass from the stall and lead him away to water him? You care for your animals on the Sabbath day. And here is a creature of God. Here is a daughter of Abraham that had been bent all these many years. Shouldn't I, shouldn't I show mercy unto her? Look at this. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bound when? On the Sabbath day, and when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Actually, those Pharisees, they were spiritually blind. 
Morally, they were blind. Religiously, they were blind. Their tradition had blinded them. And because of that, they couldn't see straight. They couldn't see right. They couldn't see this is right or that was wrong. Their tradition colored their eyeglasses. Their tradition, their religion colored and darkened the spectacles they were wearing. And therefore, they couldn't see anything right. In fact, it was an unfortunate thing for them that the prophecy of Isaac was fulfilled on them, that they were blind. Those blind leaders, those blind blind, those uh, uh, watchmen were looking at Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56, and I'm reading from verse 10. It says, Isaiah chapter 56, verse 10, thy watchmen are blind. Look at that. Thy watchmen are blind. They are, they are watching, and the enemy is coming. They can't see. The good is coming, they cannot see, and the healing is coming to you, they cannot see, because it's on the Sabbath day, they're so blind. They are blind to reality, and it says, it's, it's what men are blind, and they are all ignorant, and they all, it says, they're all dumb dogs that can, they cannot bite, and they cannot bark, and it goes on to say, sleeping and lying down and loving to slumber. And when you come to the New Testament, that's exactly what happened. Those people, they were blind to the truth. They were blind to righteousness. They were blind to the coming of the Savior. And it says in Matthew chapter 15, Matthew chapter 15, reading from verse 14, the identity of those leaders and the description of those leaders and the unfortunate thing that had happened to them, even though they were leaders in Israel, it says in Matthew chapter 15, reading from verse 14, it says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. What a pity. Blind leaders of the blind. Those uh, people in Israel themselves, the Jews, the people, they were blind spiritually. They couldn't see the way of salvation. And the people professing to lead them in that way of salvation, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, what will happen? Both shall fall into the ditch. The people perish and the leaders perish because they were blind. And you can see the blindness as you look at this passage. Let's look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 16. Jesus was very pointed and pungent and direct. It says in Matthew chapter 23 verse 16, Want you, ye blind guides. Want you, ye blind guides. Or talking to the Pharisees, they were blind. And then look at uh, verse uh, 17. In verse 17, uh, Jesus continued, ye fools and blind, ye fools and blind. And then in verse 19, talking to these uh, Pharisees and leaders, it says, ye fools and blind. Again, that's the third time in one chapter. And then in verse 24, in verse 24, it says, ye blind guide was straight which is strain at a knot and swallow a camel and then in verse 26 it said that blind pharisee that blind pharisee if you see ye blind ye blind ye blind now he pointed at them and he told them and he called their name and he said ye blind pharisee cleanse forth that which is within the cup of the and the platter and that the outside of them may be clean also and let's look at uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, what a problem they had. And many people still have the problem today. They read the Bible. There's no, there's no problem of reading the Bible. They have this big Bible, this size Bible, this uh, other Bible, this commentary and everything. And they read through everything. They cannot see about salvation and freedom from sin. They read through everything. They cannot see about holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. They read through everything. They cannot see the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives today. Although they are reading, but they are blind. I pray you will not be blind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm reading here from verse 14. It says, but their minds were blinded. 
Their minds were blinded. Their understanding darkened. It says, for until this day remaineth the same veil, the same covering, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Look at that. It says, in the reading of the Old Testament, the same veil is still there, which veil is done away in Christ. But they didn't recognize Christ as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the Savior, as the one that will give them illumination, as the one that will bring light into them, as the one that will forgive their sin, as the one that will give them salvation, as the one that will point them towards seven, as the one that will reconcile them to the Almighty God. They thought it's religion, religion, religion. And they're reading the Old Testament. Look at verse 15 there. But even, but for, e but even unto this day, even unto this day when Moses is read. What does that mean? When they read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, when they read about the Sabbath, when they read about all those Old Testament ceremonies and rituals, it says the veil is upon their heart. The veil is where? I said the veil is where? Upon the earth, it says, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. There are things you will not understand until you turn to the Lord. There are things you will not understand until you are born again. There are things you will not understand until the blood of Jesus has washed you and cleansed you. There are things you will not understand until a new life and a new light has come into you. It says, Nevertheless, the veil, the covering, and the darkness will be taken away when you come to Christ. Their wrong interpretation diverted attention from the real issue. What's the real issue? A miracle has happened that has never happened in the Old Testament or anywhere. What has happened? A miracle has happened that no prophet of the Old Testament has done. They should be asking the question, is this not the Christ? Is not this the Messiah? Is not this the Savior? Is not this the one that the Heavenly Father promised is going to send unto us? Look, he is come. But because of the wrong interpretation and because of their indignation, the important revelation that has now come was of no value to them. The things of eternal value did not matter to them at all at this time. Look at Luke. This is what they should be thinking about. Luke chapter 2. I'm reading from verses 10 and 11. Luke chapter 2. Verses 10 and 11. Here he tells us the central thing, the essential thing, the important thing. They should have been thinking about Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's the essential thing. That's why Christ performed that miracle. That with this miracle, something happening that never happened before in the history of the children of Israel, in the history of the whole world, they will know that this is the Christ, the Savior of the world. But they miss that important thing because of the argument and because of their wrong interpretation. John chapter 4 verse 42. John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 42. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy sin, for we have heard him ourselves. And we know, and know, that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. That's the issue. That's the main issue. That's the central thing. That's the foundational thing. That's the thing the Lord wanted to show them. I'm the Savior. This is the Lamb of God that came to take the sins of the world away. They missed it because of their religion, being blindfolded by religion. Acts chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 12. Acts chapter 4, we're looking at verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. Did you understand that? Because what he did to the blind man, nobody has ever done. What he did to the blind man, since the world began, it has not been known, it has not been heard, that the eyes of a man that was born blind was open. And this should tell them, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. 
but they missed it because of their wrong interpretation. You know something? Look up here for a minute. And you know, if, if you have something on your heart that you, you, know, you are kind of forceful about, and that you say, hi about this, and hi about this, if you have something, an axe to grind, and if you have something that you are arguing about, I don't like this, I don't like that, you miss the real issue. You miss the real issue. Your own attitude and your own interpretation and viewing things and concentrating on things that are not essential. That's what makes you to miss the real essential thing that they missed over here. They saw Christ. They didn't see salvation. They, see, they saw the blind man. They didn't see the miracle. And they saw everything. All they were thinking about Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. And the Sabbath did them no good. And they were crying Sabbath, Sabbath until they died. And they went to hell. What's the use? What's the use of concentrating on something that is not going to give you salvation? And it's not going to give you reconciliation with God. I pray that you will leave all those things in Jesus' name. And then come to the real, the real thing and the main issue that we're going to have life eternal in the name of the Lord you'll have in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now, the frequent intimidation and iniquity of the broken parents. We're coming to chapter 9 and I'm reading from verse 18. We're coming to chapter 9 of John, verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that uh, he had been blind and received the sight until they called the parents of the parents of him uh, that had received a sight. And then it says in verse 19, uh, and they asked them, saying, Is this your son? whom ye say was born blind, how then does he now see? His parents answered them, and they said, We know that this is our, own, is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. By what means he now seeth, we know not. Do you think they didn't know? I said, Do you think they didn't know? He was, he, the man was telling everybody around. He made clay and put on my eyes. And I went to wash in the full side loam. And I washed and I came seen. He told everybody, why wouldn't he tell his parents? He says, we know not. Uh, we know that this is some. And that he was born blind. But by what means, by what method, by what, uh, whatever. Uh, he now seeth, we know not who, or who has opened his eyes. But a man mentioned the name. He said it's Jesus. They said, We know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. Look at verse 22. These words speak his parents because, tell me, because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess, that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, is of age, ask him. The frequent intimidation. What had happened here? You see, the Pharisees had used the weapon of intimidation and the weapon of threats. And the weapon of incessantly making remarks and saying, anybody that came to the synagogue, anybody that came to the temple, anybody that came on the Sabbath day, you'll say, everybody, you understand? You have this chance, you're coming to this uh, temple, you're coming to this synagogue because you listen to what we say. If you don't listen to what we say, we're going to drive you out of the synagogue. Wait a minute. Coming to the synagogue did not give peace of mind. Coming to the synagogue did not give assurance of heaven. Coming to that synagogue did not give them the way of salvation. Coming to the synagogue did not link them up with God the Almighty that's able to do all things. Coming to the synagogue did not make their families better. Coming to the synagogue did not give them light of the scriptures. And yet that useless thing, that worthless thing, they were holding it up and they were threatening everybody. If you go to say that this Jesus we are hearing about, 
out is uh, you know is the Christ we're going to drive you out of the synagogue the weapon of frequent intimidation you see there are people that do that they want to block your way to salvation they want to block your way to holiness they want to block your way to heaven and they have intimidation 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 and it's frequent and then it's prolonged threats prolonged threats they said it uh, last year they said it last month they said it last week they said it yesterday they're still saying it today they are prolonged threats and then it's incessant remarks incessant it's continual false alarm it, they say that you know the synagogue is not going to accommodate you the synagogue is not going to accept you if you go that way because of that frequent intimidation the people were broken that is, their minds were broken, their backbones were broken, their convictions were broken. They couldn't stand up anymore for anything. There's no conviction anymore in them. And it affected these uh, parents as well, that now these parents were now broken. That's why we titled this section, The Frequent Intimidation and Iniquity of Broken Parents. These uh, parents, what do you know about them? Number one, they had no will to stand for the truth. They were broken. And if you are like that, you have no will, you have no mind, you have no determination to stand for the truth in the midst of so-called friends and the midst of the people of the world. You have no will to stand for the truth. You are broken already. Number two, they had no will to decide their own eternal destiny. Here is Jesus Christ that will give them life eternal. Here is Jesus Christ that will take them from earth and take them to heaven. They had no will to stand on their own and to decide on their own for their eternal destiny. Number three, they had no courage to withstand feeble opposition. Feeble opposition. The opposition was feeble. Even the blind man could confront those Pharisees. The blind man could stand and withstand those Pharisees, but the parents that were not blind physically, they didn't have that uh, kind of uh, courage to withstand the feeble opposition. They become so afraid that somebody takes his cheek of a broom and he raises it up like this, and you believe there's so much power in that little stick of broom that you're hiding, that you're fasting, that you're praying, oh God, what will I do? You're so weak now that you see something in the dream and that little thing in the dream and they say ah they have not even touched you there's no cutlass in their hand there's no gun in their hand but to say they have come they have come they have come again you are so weak now you don't have any courage to stand against feeble opposition the wheels were broken the minds were broken the backbones were broken number four they had no heart to uphold their conviction no heart, they were ungrateful, they were unthankful that Jesus Christ took their son and then this son that was born blind, no medical sign could do that for them, no traditional medicine could do that for them, no power on earth could do that for them, but because of these Pharisees, the Pharisees had nothing, they promised nothing. They gave nothing. They benefited nothing. The Pharisees were just there. They were there without anything to contribute to their lives. But you know, these people, they had lost their heart to uphold their conviction. Number five, they had no backbone to stand alone for what's right. No backbone to stand alone for what's right. They knew that Jesus had performed the miracle. And this Jesus Christ, look at what he has done, is bless our family. He has blessed our son. Look at the joy in our son now. The blind eyes were open. When this child was born, we were crying in the family. We were unhappy in the family. We were saying, how could we have a boy like this? It's going to be dependent, be a parasite all through his life because he was born blind. And now Jesus Christ has taken that thing away and that deformity away. He has taken that stigma away from the whole family and these people could not have the backbone to stand for what's right. Number six, they had no power to confront error or truth. No power to confront error or truth. You see, when you are broken, you are like that. Your mind is broken. Your backbone is broken. Your intelligence is broken. Everything about you is broken. That you know this is the right thing. But you cannot stand now because you're a broken man. You're a broken woman. Number seven, no dignity to protect their children from impostors. 
no dignity to protect that son from the imposing uh, a kind of uh, Pharisees. And they could not say, yes, that's her son. It's got a great miracle. And Jesus Christ has done this for him. They couldn't do that because they were broken. What broke them? A fear of man. And if you have fear of man, you'll be so broken, you cannot stand for the truth. You know it in your heart, but you cannot stand for it. In your office, you cannot stand. In your family, you cannot stand. Because you're a broken man. Because you're a broken woman. Your will is broken. Intimidation has broken you. The fear of man has broken you. I pray that today the Lord will strengthen you. It's strengthen your mind. It's strengthen your heart. It's strengthen your backbone. Your will stand. I said your will stand. Am I talking to somebody there today? All their fears will be taken away from your life in Jesus' name. Look at Proverbs, look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. And I'm reading from verse 25. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. The fear of man, what does it bring? Bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. If you put your trust in the Lord, you'll be saved. I said you'll be saved. Because those Pharisees, they can do nothing to you. They cannot touch your life. I said they cannot touch your life. You'll be under the wings of the Almighty and nothing will make you to, cr to cringe or to crumble and you will not fall in Jesus' name. Uh, look at what fear of man does in uh, Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. I'm reading here from verse 11. Isaiah, read to open this one. Isaiah chapter 57, reading from verse 11. And it says, and of whom hast thou been afraid or feared? It's asking you a question. Think about it in your office. You couldn't stand. Of whom have you been afraid or feared? Think about this in your family. Think about this in the village. Think about this in your town you came from. It says, of whom hast thou been afraid or feared? Think about this in your market. As they are saying, if anybody does not pay the deal of worshipping idol, he will not sell in this market. We are going to carry all their things. Of whom hast thou been afraid or feared? You want to take a decision whether to marry this or not to marry that. And then you say this is not the will of God. And then you are afraid. What was so and so say, what your such and such says, look at verse 11, and of whom hast thou been afraid or feared? Or it is that you want to, you know, do whatever. You want to take yourself and say, enough is enough. Now I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm going to get ready for heaven. Looking at all the things we see in the sky, on the sea, in the street and everywhere. Looking at everything we see, we know that Christ is coming. And I know without holiness I cannot see the Lord. I'm going to take my stand and I'm going to be holy and then you remember so and so so and so now is standing like a mighty giant before you and even though you know the truth even though you know the way and you are prayed and consecrated at the bible study and you say now lord i'm going to follow you but of whom have you been afraid or feared that thou hast lied parents that thou hast lied man woman that thou has life preacher that thou has life what are you afraid of it says look at that verse 11 again of whom hast thou been afraid or feared that thou hast lied and hast not remembered me nor laid it to heart to thy heart have not i held my peace even of old and thou fearest me not you cannot fear God and fear man at the same time. If you fear God, you'll not fear man. If you fear man, you'll not fear God. And he says, what are you afraid of? Who are you afraid of? You will stand. I said you will stand. Now we come back to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Uh, we're reading now from uh, this, uh, verse 22. It says in verse 22, these words speak the parent experience because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, 
he should be put out of the synagogue. Look at uh, uh, their action. What does it show? It shows iniquity. Iniquity. What does that mean? They denied the one who has blessed them. They denied the one who brought light into the family. They denied the one who changed the life of their son forever. And look at that kind of iniquity and look at what the Lord is saying about that. We're looking at Luke, Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 24. Luke chapter 9, we're looking at verse 24. When you deny the Lord like that, when you lie, when you lie, when you're hypocritical, and when you say you don't know what you know, when when you say you don't know who has opened the eyes of your son when you know it is Jesus and then you tell that lie, blatant lie and flagrant lie look at chapter 9 of uh, Luke I'm reading from verse 24 it says in verse 24 for whosoever whosoever will save his life shall lose it but whosoever will lose his life for my sake the same shall save it for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away for whosoever whosoever help me shout that word whosoever for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the son of man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels look at chapter 12 chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 9 chapter 12 reading from verse 9 it says he that denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. These broken parents, they were denied Christ before men, before the Pharisees, because of fear, because of synagogue, because of tabernacle, because of religion, because of the threats of those Pharisees. And Jesus said, you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the angels of God in heaven we're coming to chapter one of romans romans chapter one i'm reading from verse 19 romans chapter one and we're reading from verse 19 romans chapter one verse 19 it says because that when that which may be known of god is manifesting them for god has showed each unto them that which is uh, to be known of god of the son of god have been revealed he opened the eyes of their son and the you. Look at this. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All these, uh, you know, this mother and this father, the parents, they were without excuse because they knew. They knew the right thing. They knew the truth, but they won't tell the truth. Look at verse 31. Because, because, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither was thankful, neither was grateful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was Darkened. The foolish heart darkened. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Reading from verse 17. James chapter 4, verse 17. We're going to read this together. James chapter 4, verse 17. James chapter 4, what's the verse? Everybody, one, two, three, go. Our brethren outside, it seems I can't hear your voice. Outside, outside brethren, one, two, three, go. Wonderful. The Lord will bless your life. Yeah. Brethren inside, your own turn, one, two, three, go. Yeah. You will not commit sin. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good. All those, uh, those parents, father and mother, they knew the right thing. And he could have said, 
very clearly, very pointedly, directly to those Pharisees. It will help those Pharisees. If somebody could confront them, if somebody could show them that all their threats were nothing and that this Jesus will believe is the Christ, they could have done that, they will be doing good. But he didn't do that and therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. We are coming to... Uh, they, they say, now we're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 33. Matthew chapter 10. We're reading from verse 33. Matthew chapter 10. Reading from verse 33. It says in verse 33, But whosoever, whosoever, whosoever shall deny me before men, he will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. You know what you have read? He said, I will deny him before the angels. I will deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Second Timothy chapter 2, we're reading from verse 12. You go to your office, you will not deny Christ. And you go to your market, you will not deny Christ. And you go to your family, families where there are unbelievers and they want to threaten you and humiliate you. If you are going to be part of this family and you are going to keep on using the name of this family, you must not say that born again, born again. What's, the, what's in that name of that family? A family that does not know God, a family that will not honor Christ and salvation, Give it up and then say whatever you say. I'm all right because I'm going to follow Christ. And thank God I'm going to follow Christ. I said I'm going to keep on following Christ. You follow Christ in Jesus' name. Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter two, and I'm reading from verse. I'm reading from verse twelve. Second Timothy chapter two, verse twelve. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, what will He do? He also will deny us. You see those broken parents, they were bound by the spirit of fear. It becomes a spirit. It becomes a spirit of fear that binds a man, binds a woman, and their iniquity was the sin of number one, denying Christ. The sin of denying Christ. When you have a chance to speak up. A chance to point to Jesus and a chance to say Jesus is the Christ. And you dodge the sin of denying Christ. Number two, the sin of lying. The sin of lying. They said, that's our son, that's right. He was born blind, that's right. As to what means by whom he has received the sight, we know not. That's lying. The iniquity was the, son, was the sin of lying. Number three, it was the sin of Hiding the truth that saves. Hiding the truth that saves. That they couldn't come out and say this is the truth. And that is the truth that saves. Number four, it was a sin of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. They knew the right sin. They deviated and they evaded the truth. And they avoided the truth. It was a sin, number five, of insincerity. They were not sincere. They were not sincere. They said, that's her son. They said he was born blind and now he has received his sight because everybody could see he had received the sight, but they were not confessing that. The sin of insincerity, number six, is the sin of unthankfulness, the sin of ingratitude, the sin of not giving honor to the Lord Jesus Christ who has done such a great sin for them. Number seven, it was the sin of hindering others from believing. Hindering others from believing. They could have gone to town. They could have said, come, see our boy. And see, he was born blind. This never happened to any family. We're a special family. We're a privileged family. And this spectacular miracle has happened to our son. See this one. Let us take you to Christ. He also, he'll heal you. He'll save you. He'll deliver you. He'll take you from earth to heaven. They lost that opportunity because of the iniquity, the sin of hindering others from believing. Number eight is the sin of careless indifference for their own salvation. Careless indifference for their own salvation. They could have been saved. They could have gone to Christ and said, were the parents of this man that were born blind. And then he just told us, and we can see, he has perfect eyesight. And if you could do this for him, we need you. You'll forgive our sins. 
you will save us. You will change our lives. They didn't do that. Their careless indifference made them to miss the opportunity of salvation. We're coming back to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. And I'm reading here now from verse 24. John chapter 9. We're reading from verse 24. It says, Then again, called they the blind, the blind, uh, the man that was uh, blind, and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Look at this, people. We know. We know. Well, that is to see. I'll be following this man. And we know him. We know that he's a sinner. Verse 25, he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know. One thing I know. Do you know one thing? Do you know anything? Have you met Christ? Has he done something for you? Can you testify about him? One thing I know. That whereas I was blind, tell me, now I see. Then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How open he thine eyes. He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore will ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Wonderful. Look at the blind man whose eyes had just been opened. He said, I told you already. You want to know? I can repeat it, but I don't want to waste my time with you. Do you want to be his disciples like I am? And then they said in verse 28, then they reviled him. Then they looked down on him. Then they abused him, they insulted him and said, thou art his disciple. But we are Moses' disciples. They said, we know that God spake unto Moses, but as for this fellow, look at how they are referring to Jesus, as for this fellow, we know not where he is. Look at this, number one, the blindness of self-deceivers. The blindness of self-deceivers. Hey, these were deceptive people. They said, look at this, they said, we know in verse 24, Give praise to God, for this man is a, tell me, is a what? A sinner. Look at chapter 8, chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 46. Chapter 8, verse 46. Which of you convinces me of sin? Which of you convinces me of sin? You know, they were speaking so, so certainly to this man who had received this sight. They said, we know he's a sinner. But Jesus said, which of you have convinced me of sinning? Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 of John. This was self-deceivers. They were deceiving themselves. They knew they were not telling the truth about Jesus. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, tell me what? We know. Rabbi, well, not only me, we know. We know. We Pharisees, we know. We know that thou art a teacher. Come from God. For no man can do this miracles that thou doest except God be with him. But when they wanted to deceive people outside, they deceived themselves. What they knew, they hid that one. They said, we know that he is a sinner, but here he says, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Deceivers. I will not be a deceiver. Say it aloud if you mean it. First Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy chapter 1, we're reading from verse 6. First Timothy chapter 1, we're reading from verse 6. It says in verse 6, From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. All they were saying became vain jangling. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they are firm. 
those Pharisees, they didn't understand themselves. But now, let's go to the next thing here, the boldness of self-disclosure. We're looking at John chapter 9, John chapter 9, verse 25, the boldness of self-disclosure. It says in verse 25, verse 9, it says, chapter 9, verse 5, he answered and said, whether you be a sinner or no, I know not. I'm not going to argue with you on that. One thing I know, the boldness of self-disclosure. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, say that aloud. Say it with confidence. It says, now I see that's the boldness of this man that said, well, I know what I was. I know what I am now. And when you are saved, you'll be like that. When you are born again, you'll be like that. When your sins have been forgiven, you'll be like that. When a spiritual darkness has been taken away from your mind's eye, you'll be like that. And when that uh, thing that covered you, when it's taken away from you, you'll be like that. You'll say, I was once a sinner, but now a saint. I was guilty, but now I'm free. I was wretched, but now he made me whole. He turned my life around and look at uh, Romans chapter 6 Romans chapter 6 you know your past and know, now you know your present and you know that a great change has happened a great transformation has happened in Romans chapter 6 I'm reading from verse 17 but God be thanked that she were, you were in the past, you were in the past, servants of sin, but she have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. Ye became the servants of righteousness. That's going to give you boldness. That's going to give you assurance. As a thief, now I steal no more. A liar, I lie no more. I was doing this and doing that before. But now a change has come upon me. Verse 22. But now be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. I pray that assurance will be upon your life. Look at Romans chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. Romans chapter 7, look at verse 5. It says, for when we were in the flesh, that's past tense, the bushels of sin, which were by the Lord did work in our members. It says uh, to bring forth a fruit unto death. But now, but now, things are different now. Something happened to me. Things are different now. My eyes are open. Things are different now. My life has changed. Things are different now. Eternal life has come. He says, but now we're delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I pray that this light will shine in your heart. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them. Look at verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine, out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. A new day has come. A new era has come. A new experience has come. And because of that, there is light. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 6. It says, so that we may boldly say, like this man, he was bold. He, I said he was bold. A new convert, he was bold. Some people tell us, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I've been coming to the Bible study. I know the Bible from cover to cover. I can look at any passage of the Bible and interpret. I hear you, I hear you. But look at this man. Do you have the boldness of this man? Do you have the authority of this man? Do you have the assurance of this man? Do you have the confidence of this man? Do you have the conviction of this man? So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Amen for everybody. 
Look at that again. So that we may boldly say. So that I will boldly say. Say that. So that I will boldly say. The Lord is my helper. Say it out aloud. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What man shall do unto me. It will help you to keep your salvation. It will help you to keep your conviction. It will help you to remain courageous. It will help you to face the Pharisees and tell them, I don't know about your answer. I don't know about what you are saying. But I know that once I was blind. But now I see, not only that I see he, Jesus Christ, that to say you don't know, he has opened mine eyes. We're coming back to John. Uh, we've seen this John chapter 9. John chapter 9. And as I'll be reading from verse 24, we've seen the blindness of, of self-deception, self-deceivers. We've seen the boldness of self-disclosure. Now we look at the bluntness of a fresh disciple. The bluntness of a fresh disciple is a just saved, just forgiven. Just receive the miracle. Just know Jesus Christ for the first time. The freshness of faith and the freshness of conviction and the freshness of his conversion and the freshness of his conviction as well as the confession. The bluntness of a fresh disciple. Look at John chapter 9 verse 26. He said, uh, they said unto him, uh, then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How open he thine eyes. And he answered them, I have told you already. And ye did not hear. Wherefore, well, would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples blunt, direct? And he wasn't looking down. He was looking at them. And now his disciple. And now his follower. I can tell you again. If you want to hear it again. But why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be like me and be his follower? And be his disciples? Look at them. They reviled him. That's persecution. They reviled him. They looked down him. And they said, Thou art his disciple. We are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses. But for, for this fellow, we know not whence he is. And the man, look at the man now. And the man answered and said unto them, Why? Herein is a marvelous sin that she know not from whence he is, and yet he opened my eyes, and yet he opened my eyes, and yet, has your eyes been opened? I said, have your eyes been opened? Has he touched your heart? Has he touched your life? Has he forgiven your sin? Has he changed your life? You'll be able to say that confidently. you say you don't know him, and yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know, now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshipper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth since the world began. Was it not her that any man opened the eyes of a man, of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Verse 34. He answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins. Dost thou teach us? Did he want teaching? Did he want revelation? Dost thou teach us? But thank God the man was blunt. And the man was direct. And as you go out in the strength of the Lord, in the revelation that God has given you, in the boldness of the word of God, and the transformation that God has done in your life, you'll say, no man will intimidate you. No man will cower you down. And no man will seize your tongue and seize your heart and seize your mind that you will not do what you need to do and say what you need to say. The boldness of the Lord will be upon your life. And the goodness of the Lord will keep on flowing in your life in Jesus' name. And you will say, and you will say, I'm coming back to that Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading here from that verse 6 again. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 6. This is what you will say. You'll say, so that I may boldly say. Can you say that? So that? So that? In your office, you'll be bold. 
In the market, you'll be bold. In your family, you'll be bold. Everywhere you go, you'll be bold. You'll be bold for God, bold for Christ, and bold for righteousness. In Jesus' name, the Lord is my helper. You see your helper? The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And thank God they can do nothing. I say they can do nothing. Rise up in the strength of the Lord. Rise up in the boldness of the Lord. And make sure that your eyes are open. Make sure that your sins are forgiven. Make sure you are born again. Make sure you are a child of God. And make sure it gives you conviction. And then you can go out anywhere you go. You can stand by that conviction, that confession. And you can say, I will boldly say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.